Anne was responding to Megan, said she's got air, hunger, and oxygen levels are normal. Uh, thinking it has to do with adrenals. It is likely not due to adrenals. Um, and the reason for that is your adrenal glands are going to emit a couple different substances, but they're mostly regulatory hormones that are responsible for um, their glu glucohomeostasis, mostly. So if we're having air hunger and oxygen levels, a lot of that's not super detected in the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands are a motor gland, so they don't have a, a, like a huge sensory system. They mostly take their orders from the HPA axis or the, the hypothalamus, and then the hypothalamus, hypothalamus gets its marching orders from um, the prefrontal cortex largely, also the reticular cortex. But these areas that basically control outputs from the brain that then come down and talk to the paraventricular nucleus and then give some orders that are maintained through hormones. The adrenal gland is a gland, so it'd be like kind of like saying like your lacrimal gland or your like you know your your salivation gland would be would be relevant to oxygen levels. It just the likelihood is low. The job of the adrenals is to emit a chemical, and those chemicals are largely due to being able to maintain um, glucose levels, energy levels uh, as their main, their main tracking point. So not a big sensory change in the adrenal system, more in what we're looking at in the brain. It's important though, because you'll see, and this is not, this is not to be disparaging here, but it's a very good point because the adrenals kind of get thrown at everything. Um, somebody had mentioned the other day that somebody posts about adrenal fatigue being a common cause of orthostatic intolerance. And it's it's like very likely not. And why that would be is because you think about what is being released or how do you diagnose adrenal fatigue? Okay, so you diagnose adrenal fatigue. Well, number one, um, there's a large subset of the world that doesn't, that would argue that adrenal fatigue is a thing at all. Barring that, withstanding, so let's say you assume it is a thing. Then you would say, like, well, you look at diurnal cortisol rates. So you do um, four salivary cortisol tests in a day at different points throughout the day. And you just look at the rhythm of that. And the suggestion is that we'd be out of rhythm or low. Problem with that is if you look at low cortisol production as an indicator that the adrenal gland is, isn't working as well as it should be, then you'd say it's hypoadrenal function, which has the name as Addison's disease if it's to a degree where we actually see the adrenal glands failing. But what we see in adrenal fatigue is, is that's probably not the case. And if we, were, if we were saying that cortisol levels being skewed are an indicator of um, orthostatic intolerance, people will say it's because your, your fight or flight uh, systems are activated. But if that were true, then the cortisol levels that's not that's not really a good way to think about that because if cortisol levels are low or um, dysmetric, then we would actually see is a decrease in energy production because the main function of cortisol everybody talks about it as a stress hormone that's not its primary function. The primary function of cortisol is for glucose homeostasis, meaning it helps to regulate gluconeogenesis uh, the liver helps with um, converting fat and protein into like different types of energy sources. So its primary job is not as a stress hormone. The primary job is to liberate glucose and to stabilize against insulin. So it's like a glucose mediated chemical that as a byproduct, if you need a lot of glucose because you're under a lot of strain or we could say stress, like we need more energy, then we're gonna demand more of that glucose system. And here's why we see the correlate with um, insulin levels and reactive hypoglycemia and these types of problems because when you look at um, like like a functional medicine approach toward adrenal fatigue, what it really is is glucose management. So we're actually looking at dysglycemia as the primary problem that's often treated and is treated by changing dietary habits of protein consumption, meal timing, and then using different types of adaptogens to be able to kind of regulate that. So. Um, I think that's really important, though, because what we're really talking about in that system is is a glucose problem. So like glucose regulation problem, not so much orthostatic intolerance. So if your if your tachycardia exists as a function of your dietary pattern, then we really want to pay attention to are you dysglycemic? Do you have reactive hypoglycemia? Do we need a glucose panel and, and learn how to understand how to regulate glucose levels, how to regulate insulin levels 
so they're, we're not having these energy spikes that yield kind of similar looking findings where you might feel lightheaded, you might feel shaky, you might feel um, like you're having some orthostatic intolerance or some, some volume troubles, but they could be relative to glucose control, which is a very good place to start uh, if, if you're kind of in that boat. If you notice that your symptoms are worse if you're hungry or after you eat. So like if I haven't eaten recently enough or after I've just eaten, I'm always like in that, like that pattern, um, then making sure that your glucose is stable is probably a very good first step because that may be the actual problem and it may not actually be something that's related to orthostatic tolerance in general. That's like its own kind of separate problem. So if someone tells you adrenal fatigue is the problem, it's probably not, there's not a lot of logic there. Um, it'd probably be more useful to say, like, if I'm noticing those patterns, then maybe looking at my glucose regulation, if that's in check, you check that box off, um, then kind of moving on beyond that and starting to look not just at um, glucose, but looking into more mechanisms we're talking about with, with hemodynamics. Irene McBean, sometimes a point of contact or weighted or light pressure stimulus is helpful for her disequilibrium. That is an excellent point. So for a lot of people, that experience that that disequilibrium, and we've got we've been having this conversation all week. By being able to increase the sensory feedback, allows you to create a better picture of your world in your mind. So it allows you to be able to have a higher resolution, like my new camera, a higher resolution of your world, which will then shrink the uh, the like deficit of postural response. So if you think about disequilibrium as being kind of the sensation that your ellipse of posture is too big by giving a better sense of where you are in space it allows the reflexes so our postural reflexes to have a tighter feedback loop um, everybody has i guess i should have mentioned everybody kind of has an ellipse so when you breathe and when your heart beats if we stand still and close your eyes everybody when we measure them on a force plate has just a little bit of forward or backwards but it kind of goes in a little bit of a circle but it's mostly forward to back when we start to lose some of the sensory acuity from our body or from our inner ear or from our vision, what will happen is because that feedback loop is less, the tightness of that control is less. So we see that ellipse start to expand. So we may notice that it gets bigger in this plane, but it also may start to shift and move on a diagonal. And that's what people with disequilibrium sometimes will notice is that they kind of feel internally like they're doing this ellipse, right? So by being able to use weight or a weighted blanket or even just a touch, we give a, an anchor, we give, we give a signal from the world that kind of lets us know where we are in space, which increases the feedback, which means the motor output allows for a smaller ellipse and a smaller sensation of disequilibrium. So great point by Irene, but it's a really, really great point to drive home, especially for people that are dealing with male debarkment people that are dealing with disequilibrium related to sensory loss or from vestibular loss or from changes in their vision. Cool, so I hope that helps.